Welcome everyone. Today we are talking growth and I've got Suja Patel. Um, been a while since we, we've seen each other, mate, but I was lucky enough to meet you when you're in Melbourne doing a bit of a tour. Yeah, man. Um, good, good to chat. It's, it's definitely been a while. I think that was, uh, oh man, that was like four or five years ago. It feels like, you know, four lifetimes ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I'm still still working on more of the same thing, but you know, a lot more, a lot more things going on. Absolutely. And uh, look, you, you always been kind of, um, in my opinion, uh, you know, one of the masters of growth, right? And that's really what I wanted to talk about today. And I guess really what I wanted to leave uh, the audience with is just a couple of like, a couple of learnings, right? And, uh, but before we, we do all that, um, can I go back and just get a little bit of your, your background story? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, my background in, in all things digital marketing started off as an SEO. Um, I, I worked for a few companies building up kind of traffic and, and leads, um, started my own marketing agency called single grain and I'm selling that through that process. I was in the Bay area, I worked with lots and lots of startups, companies, uh, software companies and, and internet companies you probably would never think would continue to exist but they turned out, some of them turned out to be really you know, big companies like Airbnb, Expedia, LinkedIn, uh, a couple of companies that LinkedIn acquired, lots of Intuit properties. Um, so anyways, through that, I just learned that like software is more SaaS specifically is where I want to be, work with Salesforce as well. But anyways, I just, I just like, got obsessed with SaaS and I was like, this is the best business model ever. Um, and so I, I didn't know enough about SaaS at the time. But um, I, I was like, I need, I need to learn more about operating a SaaS because I know how to market it, but I don't know how to like, what's the product, the dev, the sales support, like everything else. And so I took a job as a head of marketing after I sold my business. And uh, I was like, I want to just park myself here for five years. Did that for two years, grew the company or helped grow the company. A lot of it was the product that helped grow it. Um, we'll get into that in a bit, but helped grow it from about 1 million ARR to about 15 million. And during that time in, in my, in my nights and weekends, um, built Mailshake and a few other companies. So now I run a company called Ramp, Ramp Ventures. We own and operate eight SaaS companies, um, Mailshake, Walla Norbert, Right Inbox. Um, there's a couple dozen, a couple, I don't remember at the top of my head, but yeah, we just have a lot, right? Um, yeah, I mean, a team is about like 45 or so people now. Um, just been growing. I think since we met, it was probably the early days of Mailshake. It was previously called contentmarketer.io. I don't know, we're about 6,000 something customers now, 20 something thousand users. And yeah, just continuing to grow it, you know. Um, scalable growth model. And uh, something unique about my companies is that although we have ventures in our name as a whole, holding company were actually bootstrapped and profitable and growing. So, um, hard, hard Crazy. to do. Crazy bastard. Yeah. Um, so let me, let me talk about some of this. Let's, let's get, let's dig into this because you kind of like, you know, one of the, you know, the OGs of growth hacking, right? Like, um, I want to, is it one to 15 million. Can you just talk a little bit about the, you know, the, the, the head of marketing role you had and what, what some of the things you kind of implemented there to get the growth going? Yeah. So, okay. So first of all, the, the biggest thing for growth happens in building systems, pro, like bu building growth, like mechanisms into place. Right. So um, whether you have a viral virality component, a network effect, whatever you want to call it, um, and network effects are, are, are different, right? And, and they don't just happen in the B2C world or B2B world. Like it's not as simple as, you know, you put a freaking sig your email signature says sent by Hotmail. I mean, it was simple in 2002 or 2008 when Dropbox did it, but it's not so simple since it's been used and abused. So putting some sort of growth mechanism in place, some sort of, if you can network effects or try to figure out, never stop thinking about where you can find that network effect. There's always different ways to do it. Um, I think it's about finding your 
first few scalable channels and then doubling down on the one or two that can scale. And so at, one, uh, at the company I was working at, it was called whenIwork.com. It's an HR tech startup for small businesses. Think brick and mortar, like the Fortune 5 million. Not the, not the biggest companies in the world, the coffee shops, the restaurants, and those type of companies. We, we, um, we were just trying to figure out how do we get, a, how do we get them. So um, we scaled up our SEO and content. We, we built out our paid acquisition channel. Um, we had a lot of growth from our from word of mouth, right? Um, and so we took that. I took that funnel. It was working well with about three four thousand trials a month. Took it from three four thousand um, to about twenty to twenty five thousand new trials a month. And 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 so along what we had to do to get that optimization was not just more traffic, but better conversion rates too. So. I guess to put it simply, it was word of mouth, aka right freaking product, big enough problem to solve, big enough pain point, um, with a little bit of network effect into it, two scalable channels, SEO and paid, and then optimizing the conversion rate. Not just like the website conversion rate, like visitor to free trial, but like visitor to free trial and then free trial to pay. With both those numbers, we five to seven X both numbers. And, wow. and so you can see the, you know, the magnitude of number of customers it kind of backs into. And, and yeah, look, I, w- I want to dig, dig a bit deeper on that because you, you've, you've talked about, you know, two different stages of the funnels and kind of analyzing each of those. But when, when I'm listening to you, right? Like I think when I'm talking to people about, you know, growth hacking um, and this kind of misconception around, um, you know, dark arts or something like that. And, and um, well, you mentioned two things that I think are quite, you know, critical. One was like creative thinking and a bunch of experimentation, right? So I guess the question is like, how do you define like a growth hacker? Yeah, I mean, I think the, so I think the, I think you mentioned two things that are very important, but I want to add a third part of that, which is the right time. So there's ideas right there's then there's the execution and then there's the timing of when to implement those ideas and stack ranking them based off of the right like the right problem to solve at the right time and that's i would say that's more critical than any any of the other things and so what i I, and i say that because that goes into the definition of a growth hacker a growth hacker um, is really evolved from like you know, I wrote a book called 100 Days of Growth where like it was very tactical in the early days. Uh, Ryan Holiday, um, Sean Ellis, like it was at that, at that time, growth hacking was like this like misconceived, like you hire a growth hacker, they're going to freaking figure out ways to grow the company you never knew how, right? That was some, somewhere under your nose and hidden under a blank, uh, under your mattress at the same time. Yeah. But, and what that's kind of talking about is finding growth inside of your product, whether it's, again, Dropbox, you know, share with people to get, um, to, to, to get more storage. And then they built that consumer, a consumer audience, helped them build their enterprise business. Um, the way to do that now is, okay, where in your, mo- where in your product is the aha moment? How do you reduce, uh, it, it's forced marketers to think about the product and say, okay, I've got a lead, which used to be an MQL, like a sign up for an, or an email address or a download. How does that download turn into a freaking activated free trial that's actually successfully used the software, right? And so it just pushes marketers further into the funnel, right? And so I look at this as um, a marketer that understands, uh, growth hacking is a marketer who understands how to leverage product sales and, and a slew of anything else they can do to actually grow a business. Right. Um, and it is, you don't have to be a marketer to to do it. Right. You could be a salesperson who knows how to leverage marketing and product to grow. But I think it's sales, marketing and product are the three key pieces of of growth in, in my opinion. Yeah, no, absolutely. 
and and then and then moving forward so did you kind of just get itchy feet and wanted to do your own product after that how did it, how did it kind of turn into you know so many companies you can't remember some of the names yeah so um yeah funny so um the when i was at single grain I, at some point, 2012, 2013, it clicked. I was like, I'm in the wrong business. I should be in that business, the people I'm helping out business, right? And, and so from that, I was like, I'm trying to find, the, I'm trying to get the right skill set so that I can get into the right business. Um, and in, in doing so, I was, again, I, so I started, you know, the person, uh, the adrenaline junkie, the fast mover that I am, I wanted to kind of go as fast as I could. So when I was at my day job, I found two developers. One of them had a, an idea in the Twitter automation space. They were just automating a lot of tweets, helping increase followers and engagement. And I was like, hey, you, you, you definitely need some marketing help. Let me just help you. That turned into like me being the co like jumping in, being the co-founder, re helping reshape the product. That company is called narrow.io. We hit product market fit pretty early, but it was a very small town. So we never really grew past maybe, I think our heyday was like 20K MRR. Um, and it was kind of just stagnant since then. Um, great passive income over five years. So don't get me wrong. It's good money, but just not big. And then what's now Mailshake. Now Mailshake was the opposite. We hit like two, three, 4K MRR, but went flat. And then we started decreasing revenue uh, in revenue although traffic went up our brand went up um we just never got product market fit and it took us until 2017 early 2017 so almost two years into the company to actually get product market fit and then when we got it it's like growth just came in right um and I, during this whole time so two years i i, I I actually, during that time, I left my day job and I just went to go focus on that, but I didn't have enough money to do that. So I did consulting as well to kind of consulting was my day, new day job that gave me flexibility. But during this time, I was like, crap, getting to product market fit or finding a TAM total addressable market that's worthy enough is really hard. I'm not good at this like pre-revenue stuff or like but I'm really good at marketing and I know now how to operate some SaaS companies. Why don't I just buy my way into it? So I started buying companies. And so I, 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 uh, I pinged a mentor of mine to jump in with me to operate them, uh, which my mentor, uh, Bob Senoff, who's now my partner, who bought two companies. One of them we successfully grew. The other one we kind of, again, like got some success and then it flatlined. Um, and, and so like, well, we can do this. So we did it bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we've been kind of buying one or two companies a year. Uh, I know that's a long winded answer, but yeah, I, I really suck at going from like, no, like an idea, validating it to um, product market fit to then channel market fit and channel market fit from product market fit to channel market fit is just as hard. Uh, it's also hard. And there's a timeline, which, so Product market fit is like when you find the right customer who wants to buy your product. Like, okay, you know, we've got Mailshake and it's perfect for small sales teams. Like that's who our customer is. Two to uh, three to 10 or three to 20 person sales teams. That's who we target. Channel market fit is we found the one, two, three channels like SEO, PPC, you know, door to door sales, field sales, trade shows that can help us target that customer profitably, right? Very hard to do. Um, where I'm much better at is somewhere between channel market fit and product, product market fit and channel market fit and scale. Well, I was going to ask, you know, so I'm glad you answered it anyway, was, you know, like you said you were kind of tinkering with stuff for two years with my old, my old shake before you got that product market fit and then kind of ask you to define it. Um, and so I'm glad you did. And I've never heard the term, you know, channel market fit, but absolutely makes sense, right? It's just those, um, well, a bunch of experimentation that takes place there as well, right? Like um, throwing shit at the wall, man. <laughs> throwing shit at the yeah. wall. Yeah. Yeah. And, and smart, then- um, Smart stuff at the wall, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, look, I think that like, um, yeah, they're just, they're just, you know, tiny, tiny experiments, low risk kind of stuff. Right. And then you kind of keep doubling down. And what we would do is, um, 
you know, we're running a few simultaneously. Um, can you talk, talk about, you know, you met, you referred to stack, right? And I know Justin Wu also talks about stack and growth. How, can you explain um, how you're stacking growth? Yeah. So I think, um, I think the way I look at stacking growth is okay. You at first, you know, I think let's break down the problem of a, a, a bit more. You're a new, you're, you're a startup. You want to get your first 10 customers, your first hundred customers, your first thousand, your first 10,000. Okay. Whether it's customers or users, whether it's B2C, B2B, mobile only, whatever the, whatever the platform is, it doesn't matter. You need users, you need customers, but the, the point of stacking is that you get your first 10. Okay. You get your first hundred, you get your first thousand and nothing matters. Like if you're getting your first hundred, who the F cares about your first thousand, get your hundred and then talk to me. Right. Cause like you're going to get there and what you do to get there is not going to be the thing you do to get to a thousand. What you do to get your thousand is not like at Mailshake, we're at 6,000 and we want to get to 10,000, but we're also moving up market. And so if I try to solve this problem that I'm at today, five years ago when I first started, it'd be the wrong freaking problem. Like I would have one customer of the 6,000 I have now. So what does it matter? So the, the, the concept of stacking is, uh, stacking growth is about finding, identifying, testing, trying the, 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 a channel, a tactic, and then getting to work, getting it to hum along, and then adding the next one, and then adding the next one, and then adding the next one. I'm a firm believer that you don't need a lot of channels to grow. You need one to three main channels to grow. If you look at, if you look at the biggest businesses in the world, they really only have a handful of channels, but what they're really good at is finding new ones and scaling. And like, if you look at Amazon, they, they didn't grow just by building just the shopping engine. They've got, AWS and that's a whole different business unit, right? So those guys are scaling business units. Uh, but each, if you look at each business unit, it's still maybe timing of the market, the product, the, the, the you know, the operations or the, um, I guess the, you know, some through, some through acquisitions, but they, you can't count 20 channels that Amazon uses to grow. There's probably like five, six, right? So, I'm just saying the biggest companies in the world only have a few. So my thinking is get a couple of tactics to work to get you to a hundred. Think about a hundred. What are some channels that could work? Get a cup, one channel to work, test another. So I always try to find, spend 80% of my time on the channel that's working the best and 20 on testing one or two or three other channels that can get to be the other. And I'm always trying to throw things on the other side of the wall. The other side of the wall is this like, on one side of what I'm doing is profitable, scalable growth. The other side is crazy shit at the wall. And I'm not actually trying to throw it at the wall. I'm actually trying to throw it above the wall. <laughs> and if it can get to the other side, then I can scale it and, and, and kind of go from there. Yes, absolutely. Well, you don't want to spread yourself too thin, especially if you start up because you, you, you know, your resources are limited anyway. Um, was there any kind of unexpected channels that you tried that just worked? Even over um, the years, you know, just in general. I mean, yeah, I, I think the, so here's, here's a crazy one. Um, talking to your customers and it's not a channel. It's just like, a, it's, it's something everybody can do. So we just talked to, we just, at, at Mailshake at, at all our companies, I'd say we're very much like product led, but I, behind that is the customer kind of conversations, the feedback loop. Like, um, we just talked to our customers and we asked them very open-ended questions. Like what can we improve? We take a look at everything that they say. Everybody says that can answer that form, that whatever. Um, and we then stack rank it to like what, who has the most problems and we just try to solve that. Right. So like the other part of this is also when you ask that questions, people tend to tell you what's problems in their life, not, related to your software, right? And so you can solve that too, right? So here's a good one. At Mailshake, you know, one of the reasons people churn, and again, ch solving churn is a good growth channel because if you can reduce churn, you can keep more of your customers and you can then pay for more, you can do other things to kind of get more, invest into more of the funnel. But one of the reasons people churn is that 
they just didn't have success doing it sales or they couldn't get their emails opened or responded to. And so we built this. So what I started doing at first, when people started churning for that reason is like, when they churned, I was like, Hey, like, Oh, it didn't work for you. Let's just hop on the phone. I'm just going to, I'll just tell you what to do. Go do these things. Right. Okay. Saved a few customers. I'm like, okay, well, what if I got them before they churned, right? Like when they were failing. So anyone that had a low open rate, I, I, I had the same call with them. And I was like, okay, after about 100, 150 calls, I was like, I'm saying the same freaking 20 things. And I talked to my co-founder. I was like, look, let's just build an algorithm that identifies whatever you write. And so we just started building this, what's called an email analyzer at Mailshake. And it's just like, as you type, if you start your sentence with saying, hi, my name is blah, blah, blah. We're going to say, stop talking about yourself first. Talk about the problem, right? Like we're going to just give you tips. And yep. so like, it just like went from like solving it when the customer churn to solving a problem that caused our customers to churn to building a tool to preemptively avoid a customers from failing at using our product. And then we also added some like education up front. Um, and then we found motivating. We found another problem that happened when we solved that the knowledge of why your campaign, your email copy sucks. We told you how to solve it before you did this was the motivation to do it. Right. And so it was like, we had to solve for the how, the what, the why, and then the, to, to grease the wheel of the motivating the customer to actually invest the time to fix it. Now, those are a lot of different problems, but it all came from just talking to a customer and identifying like, Hey, yeah, I, you're turning from our custom, our software. It's not because our software sucks. It's because the copy It's because our customers aren't copywriters and the copy is the most important part of the email. So, um, we just, we wouldn't have got there that fast. I'm sure we would have got there eventually, but we got there much, much quicker and, and helped us kind of build um, a relationship with our customers and giving value and a core differentiator early on that helped us gain customers. And it wasn't like a direct channel. It wasn't something that like we put that in there and all of a sudden it fixed our problems. But what it did was it changed the numbers slightly on the churn. And the next month it was a little better. And the next month it was a little better. And I'm like, oh, I see it. Absolutely. I mean, it's crazy to think, you know, like um, over the years, how many people just don't talk to their customers or like, you know, corporates in particular, where it's like, well, I talked to, you know, Debbie in sales or what, or did you talk to the customer? No, no. You know, like they're just so far removed from the, from the problems that they're, they're missing the opportunities. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't care who you are, where, what size you are, talk to your customers. And don't worry about how, how it scales. You just need to talk to like five a week or one a week. Like you just learn a lot. Absolutely. And, and, and this kind of, um, you know, helps me um, segue pretty good into like, you know, you got a big business now in helping people scale that, you know, from the outside in, it looks like um, a very sales focused approach. Am I right? It's kind of SaaS hit squad stuff. And um, it, it seems like, you know, as much as the tech, you know, as we advance in tech, there's still just that, um, that element of growth that is definitely like just hitting the pavement in terms of sales. Uh, I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think on the web profits and the agency side, you know, what we find the, we find the growth, there are opportunities, the most opportunities to the top of the funnel. So like, there's always a traffic problem. There's always a conversion problem. And as of late, a marketing transition to a sales problem. So like, it could be that we just don't talk to leads fast enough. Um, it could be that, um, it could be that we don't qualify leads. That we have too many that we can't, you know, fix. So here's an example. Um, one of the companies we acquired and we operate is called Voila Norbert. It's an email finding kind of sales leads builder uh, tool. Um, we built the thing up from like, you know, 8,000, 7, 8,000 um, new free trials a month to about 22,000 a month. Wow. Um, we have a part-time salesperson at, to start. 
a part-time salesperson, a full-time salesperson can't talk to 8,000 people, let alone 20,000, 22,000 people, right? And so like we did, we tried to do sales a couple of times, but it just never worked because we just couldn't figure out the right leads to talk to. And, and, and so it was really about some marketing handoff to sales and having some intelligence in between to qualify the right leads. Um, and so when we started doing that, like, oh, there's actually really good leads in here. We're just not seeing them because they're flooded or they're blended in with this like mix of other stuff. And so um, I, I think, you know, that that's very, very much the problem, but it goes to the trend that like marketing is no longer marketing. Marketing is the whole funnel all the way to like yeah. all the way to a transaction and then past that. Yeah. I think, yeah, you probably, you know, the, the word handoff is perfect, right? Because it's, well, it's, it's also kind of that, um, well, the illusion of the sales process in embedded in the marketing, right? Like the right messages to the leads and the sequence that takes place and all that kind of stuff where it's a sales process, but you're just automating it. Right. It's like, um, but you, and you're trying to make it look intelligent enough that it doesn't look like everyone got the same fucking message. Right. Um, <laughs> so t tell me about, um, you know, what's got you excited at the moment. And then I wanted to, um, well, even before we get onto the, I want to let's end on the inspirational stuff, but, um, you know, given the current climate, like, you know, I get kind of, you know, remiss not to talk about it because I know there's a lot of, you know, viewers and audience that are having a you know, tough time right now. And then particularly like, you know, um, you know, I'm trying to be a bit more sensitive to the messages that are going out, you know, and, and talking about like, Hey, if this is right for you now, or, you know, like, or, um, you know, if it makes sense, because there certainly are some winners at the time, but there's a lot of people that are getting hit, you know, hammered hard. How is that? How are you kind of reshaping your, your strategy given all the shit with COVID? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, it is a hard time, but, uh, and, and, and it is, it is this time and how we act or what we do that makes or breaks uh, an organization, right? Um, I think some of the biggest companies in the world have been come out of, uh, come out of a recession or hard times. And so I just wanna first start by saying, it's definitely possible. And in some cases, it's, there's tailwind, like e-commerce, um, Zoom, tailwinds, right? If you ask them about COVID, they're like, hell yeah, we just got triple the growth rate just because of people dying, right? It sucks. And then, then there's, you know, the local business and it's like, oh crap, I can't do this, right? I'm a restaurant owner. I just can't, I can't, I can't profitably be open, right? So some people have to embrace technology and change their whole funnel. But I think all of this is forces you to look at how do you, how do you, what's the healthy way to grow a business? What's a healthy customer, right? If you're a funded startup more than anybody, you should know how are you going to grow scalably past the next, excuse me, 18 months, right? Like, don't think about your next funding round. How do you, how are you going to grow? Like, what's a, what's an economical way? And sometimes the answer is there is not one. Right. And then unfortunately that, that changes the path to, uh, it, it might bring su success or failure forward. Um, and I think a lot of people look at failure and say, Oh man, I don't want to fail. But I think the real problem is not failing. It's failing. It's the act of getting to failure. Right. So like, if you, if I just said, Hey, you're going to do this awesome startup. And, but if it doesn't work out tomorrow, you're off the hook, like no big deal. You're just off the hook. It's done. But if it was like, you did this for 10 years and it failed, that sucks. Right. You don't get that time back. Right. Yeah. And so I think COVID is just kind of accelerating deterioration of bad business models. Um, VC, I, I, I don't mean in a bad way. I just mean like retail has been dying for a while. It's going to die faster. Right. Um, yeah. e-commerce has been thriving, um, e-sports just got a crazy tailwind, right? So I think it's just about 
finding what category you want to be in, right? Um, and if you're in a, a an industry that was kind of on the tail end, unfortunately, that got accelerated. Yeah, and then and then from you know just from your own personal perspective, have you seen some like interesting wins at this time? You know, with businesses you work with. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the a couple things we saw um, at, at at most of our companies, we saw an increase in so there's a decrease in leads and people like just freaked out right march april just was like crazy bad and, and it was an influx but along that time the pitch changed the the messaging changed like um the the hunger for like at web profits um a lot of people put marketing on pause we lost a lot of business and i mean we were like, what do we do? Like, okay, we got to change the approach. It's like, hey, look, it's a hard time. We can actually help you grow despite the hard time. And we're going to find ways to grow X company, right? And so it wasn't like this, we're going to build, we're going to, we're going to three X your business in the next three years. It was a, you can, we can help you grow right now. And here's what we did for these two, three other companies, right? So completely different pitch, long-term stacking growth to like, how to grow right now in the pandemic, right? And so the pitch changed. At Mailshake, we saw a lot of influx of new people who have never done any outbound sales or have done any type of email cadences. So like we had a lot of agencies come to us who just never had to do follow-up for their clients, their prospects. And I'm like, what? You never followed up after you've sent somebody a proposal or a lead or whatever? They're like, yeah, I never really had to. We just got customers. I'm like, yeah, you, you know, you can like double your conversion rate by just following up four or five times, right? And so like our CS efforts, our onboarding had to completely, had to be revised, not completely changed, had to be rethought through uh, to, to account for a different type of customer coming in. So whether it's a different type of customer, a different mindset, different skill set, all of that's a variable. And I'd say like, if you're in the software, if you're in the startup world, look at who you got in the last three months and optimize for that skill set and that customer persona, at least temporarily, because um, I bet you there's more revenue than you think. And it's a little bit requires changing how you do things just after April. And it might be that way for a while. Absolutely. Love it. Um, so, yeah. And then just to wrap it up, what's, what's getting, what's getting you excited out of bed and um, motivated at the moment? Um, I mean, I, I love, I love growing companies. It's, it's not the money. It's not the, it, it's, it's the, it's the Google analytics. It's the, it's the charts, the graph of just like seeing it grow. So the output, the outcome is something that's very, very inspirational and like kind of helps me, uh, it gives me the energy to kind of crank all day. And so, yeah, it's just seeing, um, seeing that outcome forces forces me or kind of motivates me to go work hard and get my hands dirty. Um, but right now I'm focused on pretty much across eight companies, just hiring. I think there's like four key roles I'm involved hiring just to put the right people in, on the, in the right seats um, to help continue to grow and continue our growth engine. I've kind of worked with a few people and the core team to kind of build the growth engine and I'm excited to pass it along and kind of be on the like more of the mentor side than the hands-on practitioner. Um, although that's going to help me get be, be much better with, with ideation. And then on that, you know, cause we, you know, we, we've touched on e-commerce and it, you know, kind of exploding at the moment and there'd be like a lot of, you know, solopreneurs out there, you know, how did you go from in your own business, um, you know, scale your own business and get you know less hands-on how did you manage to um to transition that like you know the wanting you know the perfectionism of a founder and the wanting to be so you know involved in everything to um delegating well um i think you know i think this is this is like my I've, I've run a couple of businesses you know i'd say like although i run eight i was gonna say like this is my second business this is my like third attempt at, you know, third kind of go around being a founder, um, third time starting something. I just happen to have eight things at play. Um, and 
I've learned that just over the time, it's, you can't be as a founder involved in everything. You have to build a team, the, the leadership team, the, the folks that kind of help you manage and take the company to the next level are the people, it is how you make the money, is how you make, how you are able to be successful. Um, and so I've learned firsthand from my first agency why I should not be, I was involved in every aspect of the business, right? Like I don't need to be doing the bookkeeping. There are people who are better than, that's their job. That's like what they're amazing at. And so if you think about as a founder, what you could build if you just hired people who are specialists and they're amazing at their job function, like, okay, yes, you did customer support and yes, you could, you should be talking to your customers, but what if you just hired somebody who's a, who's done a customer success or customer support role for five years? Like how much better would your customer's value be by them hearing from you versus a, an expert at how to communicate and help customers. Right. And so, um, if you got that at every function of your company, I think you'd end up building a better company. Absolutely. So the, the last call to action is um, Mailshake, if I've got it right. That's the, 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 the focus for you at the moment. Check out Mailshake. Um, and, um, and just where, where are they finding you, mate? LinkedIn? What's, what's the go-to? Yeah, uh, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, just search Sujan Patel. And then, yeah, check out Mailshake. We write a lot about sales content. And then if you want to learn about marketing content, um, the Web Profits blog is great for that too. But yeah, um, look, find me on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever. Um, I'm an open book, so ask me anything. Uh, you might get a varied degree of answer based off of the question. Thank you very much, Sujan. Uh, appreciate you taking the time today, mate. Thank you. It's been, it's been a blast.